Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, what is denial? Now this is an interesting question. When we hear the term denial, we often hear it in the context of substance use disorders. So if somebody is, for example, drinking alcohol excessively, but they deny they have any type of problem. Denial is really one of the most powerful and potentially destructive constructs in mental health. And it could be argued that it's on a continuum with delusional behavior. But it's more situational, right? So with delusions, we would expect somebody to be delusional about several different topics. But denial is specific to a particular situation, again, like using substances or denying that somebody's going to die or denying that somebody is having an affair or something like that. So it's specific to situations and a powerful construct. Now it's interesting because when you talk to new counselors, they just start counseling, they just start seeing people, and usually they're surprised by several things they learn about the population. Now it's different for everybody, but kind of popular themes I've heard is they're surprised about how much sex occurs in the world and how much people want sex, like sex drives are powerful and people think about sex a lot. Another area is how popular infidelity is. They're usually surprised about how infidelity is really all around us all the time. Another area they get surprised by is how many people use drugs, how often they use drugs, all the different types of drugs they use, so drug use is very common. And then the other thing I hear a lot is they're surprised by the power of denial. Now you could argue that denial is wrapped up to some degree with sex, but it certainly applies to infidelity and drug use quite often. So if you look at the surprising things that counselors find out about the human condition when they get in the field, denial is a big part and other constructs that go along with denial are big parts as well. Now you could divide denial into the different situations in which it occurs, right? I mentioned that if somebody's facing death, sometimes they deny that they're really going to die. Infidelity, we see denial all the time, this category. And really, I've seen this in a few different ways, but one of the common ways is like a three-way denial. So you have, say, a married couple, let's say a husband and a wife, and the husband starts to cheat with a woman who's single, right? So you have denial in three different places there. You have the wife saying, well, the affair's not a big deal, he'll come back, it's all going to work out. Now, it may work out, but I'm just saying a lot of times this is denial at work to some degree. You have the husband in the same situation saying, oh, I can balance this forever, right? I can have my wife and I can have a mistress and it's all going to work out and I'm going to be happy. Could that be the case? Again, maybe, but often this is denial. And then you have the mistress in this instance, you have the single woman who's having the affair with the married man saying that he's going to leave his wife and get married to me and we're going to be living happily ever after. Again, is this possible? Yes, I guess technically, but this is another type of denial we see. So we have kind of this three-way denial with infidelity. I mentioned drug use. This is a popular category for denial. Somebody's drinking excessively. They really need treatment, but they deny they have a problem. We see the same thing with other types of addiction like gambling. This is another area where we see a lot of denial. I've seen denial in other areas too, like somebody could be fired from a job because of their performance or because they committed some sort of crime, like they assaulted somebody, and they'll say, well, that employer was really just laying people off and they didn't want to tell me I was laid off, so they fired me. All right, that's denial. Clearly they were fired for a reason that was justified, but they're pretending it was all kind of around a layoff. I've seen this with people who think they're good drivers. I think many people know individuals like this who claim they're good drivers, and yet there's no evidence to support it. So, you know, I've seen people who have run into multiple parked cars in the same week, taken mirrors off, taken bumpers off, and they'll say, yeah, I'm a really good driver. I don't know what's going on there. Something to do with the car, or somebody parked in a bad place, or something like that. Another example, one of my favorite examples of denial, is there was a show a while back called American Idol. I really didn't watch it too many times, but there was this segment or this part of the show they used to do. I guess it was some sort of singing competition. And they would bring people in who clearly couldn't sing, and they would attempt to, I guess, impress these judges to get on the show or something. And, you know, you'd hear them start to 
what I'll loosely call sing, and it was just horrible sounding. And I think some of them knew, they just wanted to get on the show, just even for that part. But other people seemed to be in very strong denial. They would cry afterwards, they would say the judges didn't know what they were talking about, they would believe that they were going to go on to fame and fortune as a singer, they just needed to be discovered by somebody else. And then again, you're listening to the actual singing, and you're thinking, how could somebody really believe this is good? How could anybody believe this is good singing? And, of course, we see that it could be denial, again, in many of those instances, and even maybe in some of those instances, moving to the level of a delusion, right? But either way, I could go on with many examples, but those are just some of the categories we see with denial. We also believe that denial may have some relationship with narcissism. So if somebody has narcissistic traits, they may be more likely to deny that something's wrong, deny that their personality is a problem, deny that they have trouble in relationships, and even substance use. There could be an overlap there. Somebody who's narcissistic might be more apt, might be more likely to deny that they have a substance use problem because to admit that there's a problem there admits that they're not perfect. And that is a problem for people who are narcissistic. It's also important to remember with denial, some experts believe that denial doesn't exist. So the construct of denial isn't real and it doesn't happen the way it's described in the conceptualization of denial. The behavior might occur, it might look like denial, but it's really something altogether different. And much of the time we hear them refer to this low-grade delusion. So essentially denial doesn't exist, but delusions exist at a lot of different levels. And I'll talk a little bit about the different theories of denial here in this video. Before I get to those theories, I do want to answer this other question, which is, is denial really a problem at all? So do we need to worry about denial? We have all this interest in it. We have research publications written about it and all this. But is it really a problem? Well, the answer is yes. And to kind of illustrate why denial is a problem, I have to get a little bit into the descriptive statistics behind substance use disorder. So consider that about 5% of the population of the world has used illegal drugs in the last year, and about 2.5% of the worldwide population has used illegal drugs in the last month. So drug use is a huge problem. We see that cannabis is the most common illegal drug, then cocaine, then opiates. We see a problem with tobacco. 28% of the world's population uses tobacco. We see that 2 billion people have used alcohol in the last year, and 76 million of those people could be classified as having alcohol use disorder. We also know that alcohol causes about 2 million deaths a year worldwide. Now, kind of narrowing just to the United States, we see that almost 10% of the U.S. population has used an illegal drug in the last month. We see that over 15 million Americans struggle with alcohol use disorder, and we see that about 2.5 million people each year receive treatment, even though 24 million people actually need treatment. So if we do the math here, about 21 million people needed treatment in any given year for substance use disorders and didn't receive that treatment. And we see that only about a million of those felt like they needed treatment. So we have around 20 million people, potentially, 20 million people that could be in denial. Now, not all those people would be in denial, but still, certainly some of those people would be in denial. Some maybe didn't have access to treatment. There's other reasons. But some of them would be in denial, and it would certainly be millions of people. So denial really creates a huge cost. There's a human toll to the construct of denial at work. So with all this in mind, what is denial? Well, here's one of the problems with denial. There are several different conceptualizations of this idea. Again, some experts don't think denial exists at all. I put a number of references in the description for this video that I used to create this video. And one of them looked at six theories around denial. Really, five theories because the last one was the stage of change model. But I'm going to talk about three of these theories. But just so you know, there are six covered in this particular paper moral defect model, interactional model, mental impairment model, the psychodynamic theory of denial, phenomenological, and again that stage of change model. So I'll be talking about the moral defect, interactional, 
and psychodynamic models of denial. So starting with the moral defect model. This one's interesting because you don't see this one in the literature a lot. You won't see a lot of articles talking about the moral defect model. But it is often embraced by the popular culture and even by professionals. So the moral defect model essentially says that individuals who use substances have made a moral choice that is poor. So you can see right away how it has a judgmental aspect to it, so it wouldn't be included in mental health treatment. But a lot of people believe this. So in this moral defect model, really denial just becomes another word for lying. So this moral defect causes people to start using drugs, to continue using drugs, and to pathologically lie to themselves about the use and the consequences. So you might look at this model and say, well, it's understandable this model is largely rejected by professionals, even though, again, some professionals use it. But it actually is quite common. It's used even though it's not really called the moral defect model anymore. Like, for example, look at the 12-step programs like Alcoholics Anonymous. They have kind of a strange balance in terms of the moral defect model. They really have adopted the disease model of addiction that says that addiction is a disease that has a progression that we can identify. So it's not somebody's fault that they get addicted. But at the same time, they do endorse the moral defect model. They want somebody to take a frank look at their own behavior and accept responsibility, and they say that's important to recovery. So they've kind of found this way to balance the disease model with the moral defect model. So either way, it's important to understand in terms of denial that in this model, again, denial is just lying. And the treatment of this denial would be a moral conversion to help a client rise above character defects. So again, it's not a model that I believe in. I don't believe in the moral defect model, but it's important to realize it is out there and it influences a lot of individuals and a lot of people think about denial in that way. So moving to the next model, this is the interactional model. And this is an interesting model as well. It's kind of a simple model relative to some of the other ones. What this model says pretty simply is that denial is a predictable outcome of aggressive and inappropriate confrontation by another person. So in essence, denial is iatrogenic. It means it's caused by the practitioners trying to get people to stop using. But it's also caused by, in theory, family members and friends that would try to get people to stop drinking or using drugs. So it kind of puts the blame on everyone except the person using the substances, at least as far as the denial piece. So looking at how denial is addressed in this model, Denial would be addressed through something like motivational interviewing, so looking at the stages of change and being non-confrontational and being supportive. So really the interactional model is completely different in terms of how it looks at denial when you look at something like the moral defect model. So the last model I'll cover here in terms of denial is the psychodynamic model. And this is a model designed by Sigmund Freud and some others, but I'm going to focus really on how Freud conceptualized denial as a defense mechanism. So if we look at the idea of a defense mechanism, we see, according to Freud, it had five really key properties. It was a way of managing instinct and affect, so somebody's emotional expression. So it managed sexual and aggressive urges. We also see that defense mechanisms are unconscious, so somebody's not aware that they're using a defense mechanism. The defense mechanisms are distinct from one another, so there are several, denial is just one. They're reversible, and they're potentially adaptive and pathological. So they can be helpful to somebody and destructive to somebody, depending on how long somebody maintains the defense mechanisms. Or if we think of these mechanisms, again, as unconscious, how long the mechanisms stay around, because the person may not have direct control over the defense mechanism. So here we really see that denial helps to moderate extreme emotional reactions to changes in somebody's life. And it allows them time to integrate mostly the negative information that's new into their own identity, to integrate it into their understanding of themselves. So short-term reliance on denial might be healthy, might actually help somebody to cope and move through that stage of development. But if denial is used for too long, it becomes maladaptive. So in a sense, denial 
just looking at it quickly, just a quick glance at denial, is good. It's the maladaptive usage that would be harmful. It's the overuse, the overdependence on denial that becomes destructive. So essentially, denial is a normal grief response. Grief is normal, but it can be unhealthy if somebody grieves for too long. So that's kind of how Freud and really a lot of the psychodynamic theorists view the construct of denial. So what's the problem with this view of denial? Well, there's no real way to test this theory. I've talked about this before when talking about other defense mechanisms. It's an interesting way to conceptualize why somebody would be in a state of denial, why they would be kind of on this continuum with delusional thinking, but there's no way to test it. There's no way to know if this is how it really works. So with all these different theories of denial out there, and really these are kind of incompatible with one another, what are we to make of this particular behavior? We see people denying that they have a problem with alcohol use and denying the realities of infidelity, denying that they have a difficulty with regulating gambling behavior, and denying all these other things. So denial seems to be a real construct. We can see it. We can quantify it. But yet we don't really understand it. Is it really just a type of delusional behavior, or is it something altogether different? The answer is, I don't really know. But again, we know what we can observe. So we can certainly help to treat people who have denial, but we really just have to figure out what denial means to them, what their particular expression of denial really means and how it works for the individual. So I hope we see more research about denial. I hope we don't just give up on the construct and just say, well, it's psychodynamic and we can't really study it, or it's some other model and maybe we can study it, but we're not going to. I really hope we continue on learning about denial because, again, it has devastating consequences no matter what its true mechanism really is. I know whenever I talk about constructs like denial, there are going to be a lot of different opinions. If you agree or disagree with any of the items I indicated in this video, please put those opinions and thoughts in the comments. It is certain to create interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of denial to be interesting. Thanks for watching.